for allowing us to meet here today. This is uh, Finchley's coolest coffee bar. Um, and there's a chair for you here. And tea and coffee at the bar. Um, um, Ronick Green Party has been running speaker meetings now since November the year before last. Um, originally conceived as a way of making our business meetings more attractive, they became so good and so successful that we didn't want to uh, we didn't want to spoil them with a business meeting, so we hired them off into separate meetings, which is what this one represents. And um, we've had a glittering list of speakers, and I'm very, very, very proud today to be able to continue that tradition. We're going to talk about um, a concept that was in, built into the Green Party vision really at its inception. We call it the citizen's income. It's now becoming more and more well-known. It's gaining more and more public traction as um, basic income or the universal basic income, UBI. And I am very, very pleased to be able to uh, introduce Bob Jacobson, who coordinates Basic Income UK and the chairs Basic Income Europe. Unconditional basic income Europe. Unconditional basic income Europe. <laughs> um, and I've given her a difficult task today because um, uh, it is it is easy and customary to spend a great deal of time conjuring up for us all the vision of the utopia where we all have a basic income. I've asked Bob to do that a bit, but also to focus very much on the kind of um, problems that we might encounter in thinking about it or talking about it with other people. And after Barb has done her, her, her talk, we will go into a discussion and discuss the pros and cons of the idea, I hope. Um, and Barb has said kindly that she will introduce herself because although she gave me her potted history, I can't say I remember it accurately. So I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm handing over to you, Barb, and thank you very, very much. Well, thank for you very much for having me. Um, yeah. uh, I've got a background. So for the last 30 years, I was, uh, I've been a, an organizer uh, in various sorts of campaigns, but I got my start with the Wages for Housework campaign in the, in 1980s, so that really informs a lot of why I'm into, I'm into basic income, in fact. Um, and then after that, for about 20 years, I was involved with various health campaigns and housing campaigns in my local area uh, before I actually got involved with this. So that's more or less my background at the moment. Uh, my paid job is uh, working at a small charity in central London where I work with pensioners and I do benefits advice and I also do fundraising. So, I'm very much involved with the money aspect of things in ways more than I really want to be, to be honest. Um, right, well, I've been asked to speak about various things uh, like is it a human right? Is, um, is it affordable? I, don't, I just want to sort of take the temperature in terms of like how much, what do people know about basic income or citizens' income? We know we want it. You know you want it, whatever it is, whatever that is. I don't understand how it would work. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We should now talk about that. Mm. It needs right. to be, um, yeah, it needs to be promulgated more there? because people think it's, uh, oh, it's people, uh, benefits charges getting money for nothing. Yeah, well, exactly. we promised to release a paper on it and we never did. It is one of our policies. Oh, so. right. Yeah, there was a paper written. I don't know whether it was released publicly. I saw you saw it, but... I don't know whether you want it. Yeah, uh, the viewers at the moment yeah. know about the basic income in a way. Right, okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the essential thing about basic income is that it's it's a payment to each individual, and I think it's very important that it's to individuals and not households. Um, it's non-withdrawable, so it's not taxable, and it's unconditional in, in the sense of not being tied to any work or conditionality within a benefit system. Um, and you know you can think of it as a as a replacement for the benefit system, or you can think of it as a payment for existence. And so that's that's sort of the kind of potted definition that, that I often use with, with basic income. Um, there are a lot of people pressing for it as a as a human right. I think uh, personally, I I think there's some problems with the whole rights dialogue. I don't know if people have seen George Carlin's 
bit on YouTube about rights versus privileges, but I, I kind of agree with him actually that you know if 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 a right is a if a right can be taken away, then it's not a right; it's a privilege. And you know, obviously, you know, as much as we we will have the rights we have as insofar as we have power to enforce them, and that that's sort of how I'm I'm thinking about this. Although I mean, you know, if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, or if you look at the EU Convention on Human Rights, there are a lot of things in there which actually you wouldn't be able to access unless you had a basic income or unless you had some kind of free money in order to, whether that's to access, you know, um, whether that's to access the right to live a happy life or whether that's the right to, you know, access the courts or whatever, you know, there's a lot of, there's actually money involved in, in trying to enforce those rights. So. I think you know, that would be actually a case for basic income. Well, we should be given money in order to be able to access our rights. That would be one thing. Um, in terms of it being affordable, um, we can talk, we will, I'm sure, talk about this more in more detail later. But I mean, I would just ask whether war is affordable or the, some of the other things that we spend money on, I think, are really quite damaging. So, um, you know, there's certainly, I think, you know, the the bank bailouts have sort of shown that, you know, when we want to have the money available, then the money suddenly becomes available. Or things like QE for the banks uh, has shown that actually as much money as necessary, or whatever the government thinks is necessary, can be available at a moment's notice when when the government decides to make it available. So I mean, when the banks, may, you know, decide to make it available. So. Um, in terms of it being affordable, um, it really depends on whether you think of of the money monetary system as a closed system or something which is which is open. And you know, if you think of this is all about philosophy of money, but if you think of money as something that, that we have invent, as it's a tool that we've invented as humans, and it's so therefore it's actually unlimited, depending on what we want to use use for it, uh, use it for. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really consider the afford, you know, unless you think of, of the government budget as a completely closed system, um, which actually that that's how it's talked about in the press, and that's really what what people what people are kind of trained to believe. But when you look at what they actually spend money on, we don't actually know what the what the entire defense budget is because there's lots, you know, like when they wanted to go to Syria, some of the money wasn't a problem, or when they wanted to bail out the bank, suddenly money wasn't a problem. So you know. There, there can be these points where we just suddenly decide, right, well, we're going to spend money on the things that we need, and we can make as, we can create as much money as we need to in order to spend on, on what we need. So that's one thing. Let's see what else am I talking about here? So, so there was the affordability question. There was, oh yes, reducing consumption, which obviously is for the Greens. Well, actually, I mean, there's a whole movement. I, people know about the degrowth movement. In the Green Party, for sure. It might be yeah. what I'm talking about. I've not heard that word degrowth movement. I've not heard that phrase. Okay, well, there's, yeah. I mean, I personally, I have problems with the term degrowth because I think it's more about human progress. Zero growth, not sure about yeah, the Or zero growth. growth. <laughs> we know that the Green Party policy is including zero growth. Okay, right. Yeah. Anti growth, yeah. Well, the Germans call it degrowth. I don't know. And it's sort of the European. That's the European term for it, um, and yeah, I mean we're having a conference in, in Hamburg at the end of May about degrowth and basic income, so we'll be talking a lot about this about this issue, and I hope to learn more because I'm I'm not hugely expert on this topic.